much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Worcester. What? What's the time? Ten past nine, sir. Ten past nine? Is the building on fire? Not that I've been informed, sir, no. Mr. Finknottle is here to see you, sir. Jeeves, I'm not awake. I've not had my tea, and yet you, you bring me Finknottles. Is this a time for Fink or any other kind of nottle? The gentleman did say it was urgent, sir. Yes, well, he lives in the country, Jeeves. He gets overstimulated when he comes to London. Tell him I'll see him at the drones at 12. Very good, sir. It's all right. It's all right. It happens all the time. Mrs. Travers to see you, sir. Uh, tell Mrs. Travers I'm out and I'll deal with her in the morning. Bertie, you old ass. Wake up. It's time you were dressed. I've got a job for you. Does your master always lie about like this, Jeeves? Mr. Worcester was detained at a business meeting until late last evening. Business meeting? How do you mean a job? Why a job? What sort of job? You'll enjoy it. You've heard of Market Snodsbury Grammar School? <coughs> Never. It's a grammar school in Market Snodsbury. Mm-hmm. The prize giving takes place next Wednesday. Thank you, Jeeves. You are going to give away the prizes. Me? <laughs> what do you mean, me? Give prizes? I mean, you give prizes. The vicar was going to do it, but he strained a fetlock and he's had to scratch his nomination. No, Aunt Elia. No, 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 no. On me give prizes, make a speech. <laughs> Don't start gargling now. This is serious. I was laughing derisively. Well, don't. Well, no, I will not do it. That's final. I simply will not do it. You will do it, young Bertie. We will never darken my doors again. And you know what that means. No more of Anatole's dinners for you. Oh, now, look here. No, not another bite of Anatole's cooking do you get if you refuse this simple, easy, pleasant job. No, oh, but you have to be a frightful nib to give away prizes. When I was at school, it was generally some prime minister or other. Well, that was Eton. At Market Snodsbury, anyone in spats impresses us. Well, why don't you get Uncle Tom? He's got spats. Because, Bertie, quite soon now, I've got to sidle up to Uncle Tom and break the news that I need a cheque for 500 pounds off him for my lady's boudoir by August the 3rd at the latest. The boudoir on the rocks again, is it? Hmm. Until you have run a weekly woman's magazine, you don't know what rocks are. You remember me losing all that money at Baccarat in Cannes? <laughs> Don't I just. The casino wanted to put up a plaque. But that wasn't Uncle Tom's money, surely? No, but it was money that he'd given me to pay my lady's boudoir's bills. No law. So if you think that I'm going to ask him to put on the top hat and the lavender gloves and distribute prizes at the Market Snodsbury Grammar School... Yes, I see what you mean. I shall give you today to set your affairs in order and expect you at Brinkley Court tomorrow. <laughs> You'll enjoy it. <laughs> I can't understand Gussie Finknottle being in London, Jeeves. Till now, he's always remained glued to the country, completely surrounded by newts. Sir? Warren Jarvis. Newts, Jeeves, you know, those little lizardy things that charge about in ponds. Oh, yes, sir, the aquatic members of the family Salamandridae that constitute the genus Mulga. Yes, they're the chaps. Anyway, he used to keep them at school. I believe young gentlemen frequently do, sir. Arrived at man's estate, he retired to the depths of the country and gave up his life to these dumb chums. I suppose he used to tell himself that he could either take them or leave them alone and then found too late that he couldn't. It's often the way, sir. Morning, Molly. Morning, sir. He didn't say what he wanted, did he, Jeeves? He confided in me to the extent that he's enamoured of a young lady, but that she makes him nervous, sir. Well. Are we surprised? I mean, look at the life he's led. I don't suppose he's even spoken to a girl in five years. Well, what a lesson this is to us, Jeeves. In this life, you can either shut yourself up in a country house and stare into a new tank, 
Or you can be a dasher with the sex. You can't do both. It's a sad reflection, sir. Gussie didn't mention this girl's name at all, did he? She's a Miss Bassett, sir. Miss Madeline Bassett. When well, I'm dashed, I'm positively dashed, Jeeves. Indeed, sir. Is the young lady an acquaintance of yours? Absolutely. Her father is the beak who find me five pounds. Well, I must confess, Jeeves, until you supplied this information, I had definite doubts about Gussie's chances. But now, hope begins to dawn. He's just the sort of chap that Madeline Bassett might scoop up with a spoon. This is indeed good news, sir. I won't go so far as to say she actually writes poetry, but when a girl suddenly asks you out of a clear blue sky if you don't think that the stars are God's daisy chain, well, I mean, you do begin to wonder, Jeeves. Mm -hmm. Indeed, sir. Hello, Bertie. So, what's all this about you and Madeline Bassett? I didn't know you knew her even. I didn't. Not until I met her. She was staying at a place near mine in Lincolnshire the week before last. The dog had got a thorn in his foot and I managed to get it out for her. So, love at first sight, eh? Yes, oh, Bertie. Life would be so much simpler if we were newts. <laughs> yes, well, yes. I've said the same thing myself a hundred times. I mean, do you know how the male newt proposes, Bertie? He stands in front of the female newt, vibrating his tail and bending his body in a semicircle. No. Yes. Like this. Yes, well, it's a change from champagne and flowers, I suppose. Now, Gussie. I say. I say. It's about time someone came up with something better than the foxtrot. <laughs> This'll turn a few heads of quacks, like. <laughs> Madeline's gone to stay with these people in the country. I don't know what to do. Well, follow her, of course. I can't plant myself in a lot of perfect strangers. Ah, so you don't know these people? All I know is their name's Travers. It's a place called Brinkley Court in Worcestershire. Gussie, your troubles are at an end. This very afternoon, you will travel down to Brinkley Court as an honoured guest. You don't mean you know these Traverses. They are my Aunt Dahlia. But what do I do when I get there? Carl, oh, if you knew Brinkley Court, you wouldn't ask that question. Really? Place is simply soggy with atmosphere. I got engaged three times at Brinkley. Really? No business resulted, of course, but the fact remains. Thank you so much, Bertie. <laughs> On consulting engagement book, deeply regret am unable to come down, so am sending my friend Augustus Fink um, Nottle. Nottle, to enjoy your hospitality instead. He, well known in Lincolnshire as distributor of school prizes, so there isn't any need for me now, is there? To blue, your loving nephew, Bert. Excellent. I stake everything on propinquity, Jeeves. At the moment, Gussie is a mere jelly when in the presence. But ask yourself how he's going to feel in a week or so after he and she have been helping themselves to sausages out of the same dish day after day at the breakfast sideboard. Dolly, Jeeves. So? Well, you see, here is an instance of how you have to think of everything. You heard me mention sausages? Sausages? Yes, sir. Take down a telegram, Jeeves. I must warn Gussie without delay. He's got to create the impression in this girl's mind that he's pining away for love of her. This cannot be done by wolfing down sausages. Ready? Indeed, sir, yes. Fink Nottle, Brinkley Court, Market Snodsbury. Lay off the sausages, Bertie. Very good, sir. No, no, wait a sec. P.S. Also, avoid the ham. Yes, that should do it. <clears throat> I say, Jeeves, as a matter of interest, what are you doing? I, I merely ask. I'm sorting through these clothes, sir. Uh, these are for repair and these for discarding. Oh, wait a second. This white mess jacket is brand new. Mm, I assume it had got into your wardrobe by mistake, sir. Or else that it had been placed there by your enemies. I will have you know, Jeeves, that I bought this in Cannes. And wore it, sir? Uh, every night, at the casino. Beautiful women used to try and catch my eye. Presumably they thought you were a waiter, sir. Now look here, Jeeves. Excuse me, sir. Telegram for Mr. Worcester. 
telegram for you, sir. Uh, well, read it, Jeeves, read it. Deeply regret my foot. Consider your conduct the frozen limit. What do you mean by planting your loathsome friends on me like this? Who is this spink bottle? Deeply regret Brinkley Court a hundred miles from London as unable to hit you with brick. Come this instant. Angela broken off engagement with your other friend, Glossop. Love, Travers, sir. I say, Jeeves. Sir? My cousin Angela has broken off her engagement with Toppy Glossop. Uh, so I gather, sir. Well, we shall have to go down there at once. My Aunt Taylor is obviously all of a Twitter and my place is at her side. Very good, sir. Mm, this comes as a great shock, Jeeves. Toppy and Angela. Why, they always seem like the paper on the wall. Life is full of sadness, Jeeves. Yes, sir. Still, there it is. about uncles and aunts, Jeeves? I really couldn't say, sir. I mean, with one's parents. After a few preliminary skirmishes over sago pudding and stewed rhubarb, one settled down into some sort of amicable, if humdrum, relationship. But aunts, Jeeves. Very true, sir. I don't even know the meaning of the word humdrum. Amongst the grim regiment of my aunts, only Aunt Dahlia stands alone as a real sportsman. I mean, look at my Aunt Agatha. Indeed, sir, yes. And Aunt Julia? Quite. Sir. And Aunt Charlotte, oh, she's the one who sent me that rather bitter postcard of Little Chilbury War Memorial when I refused to take her frightful child to lunch on the way back to school. Aunts are noted for their strong opinions, sir. Uh, it's a distinguishing mark of the breed. Yes, but it's the things they say, Jeeves. Aunt calling to aunt like mastodons bellowing across primeval swamps. But swamp or no swamp, Jeeves, we must hire us to Brinkley Court. We have a duty to Cousin Angela. Cousin in need is a cousin indeed. Very true, sir. Hello, Bertie. Oh, Angela, old thing. Mummy's in the library. Hello, Aunt Delia. Ah, Bertie. Anatole and I were just going over his wonderful menu for dinner. For you, Mr. Wooster, I added this. Your favourite, my tambal de riz de veau to Lucien. Eh? Oh, wheel it on, Anatole, old friend. Wheel it on. Oh, I wheel it, Monsieur Wooster. Have no fright. <laughs> right -o. Hmm. Bertie. Ah, dearest, eh? <laughs> oh, Bertie. Decent of you to rally round. I don't know whether I'm on my head or my heels. Yes, it's a bad show, this, my dear old flesh and blood. If Tom finds out that that blasted glossop is making Angela unhappy, he'll very likely blow a gasket. <whistles> the trouble is, Tom's just had a demand from the income tax people for an additional 58 pounds, one and threepence. He says he's ruined. And what would become of us all under the iron heel of the Red Menace? If it weren't for Anatole's cooking, I doubt if he'd bother to carry on. Mm. But what did Angela and Tuppy row about? Sharks. Or rather, one particular shark. You remember that brute that went for the poor child when she was aquaplaning in Cannes? Oh, that shark. Yes, I remember some talk of it. Well, Angela was telling the story last night. Her eyes shining, her little hands clasped in girlish excitement. And what do you think that blasted Glossop did? He sat there listening like a lump of dough. And then when she'd finished, he said, Ah, oh, probably a flatfish, quite harmless. No doubt it was just trying to play. Oh, I say. Exactly. I mean, Angela has pride. She's sensitive. She told him he was a fool, an idiot, and didn't know what he was talking about. Strong words. Yes, I can see why you needed me. Yes. Or rather, not you, but Jeeves. Jeeves? That wonderful brain of his. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. Aunt Elia, I'm sorry, no. But Jeeves is not the only one with the brain. On this occasion, I am your man. Also, Toppy. Oh, hello, Bertie. You've heard of this business, I suppose? Me and Angela? Yes, some little friction, I gather, in Ray Angela's shark. Angela had just been most offensive, the little squirt. I merely seized the opportunity to get a bit of my own back. Offensive? She's most offensive. I mean, just because I happened to let fall some casual remark to the effect that I wondered what Anatole was going to give us for dinner, she said I ought not to always be thinking about food. But you still love her, don't you? I'm not saying I don't love her, little blighter. I mean, I love her passionately, but... Well, that doesn't alter the fact that, in my humble opinion, what she needs most in this world is a kick in the pants. Tuppy, old man! It's no good saying tuppy, old man. Well, I do say tuppy, old man. One is... one is shocked. One raises the eyebrows. Where is the fine old chivalrous spirit of the Glossops? Well, where's the sweet, gentle, womanly spirit of the Angelas? Telling a chap he's getting a double chin. Oh, now be fair, Tuppy. Remember the time you told her that her new hat made her look like a Pekingese? May as well. Did make her look like a Pekingese. But that wasn't vulgar abuse. Just sound constructive criticism. Well, I mean, the only way to work the thing might be to tip her off in some, well, indirect way that I'm prepared to open negotiations. Tuppy! I've got it. There is one infallible method of indicating to a girl that you love her. Don't eat any dinner tonight. What? Well, think how impressive it would be. She knows how devoted you are to food. I am not devoted to food. No, 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 of course not, no. All I meant was that if she sees you push your dinner away untasted, well, she will realise that your heart is aching and, and she'll probably be the first to suggest blowing the all clear. Look, I have a healthy appetite, that's all. Food, qua food, means nothing to me. No, 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 of course not, no. Push away a dinner cooked by Anatole. That's right. It's pretty extreme, that. <sighs> the extremer the better. It will be agony. Well, not for long. You could always slip down tonight when everyone's in bed and, 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 uh, and raid the larder. Oh, yes. Yes. I see. I could, couldn't I? Yes. I expect there's something cold there. There is something cold there. More than steak and kidney pie. We had it for lunch today. One of Anatole's ripest. Oh, it was a masterly pie, Bertie. You should have seen it. Not too much kidney, just enough to give it that touch of bite. A lashings of steak. Mm, that's just good steak, too. Stop it. What? Oh, right. Yes, yeah, right. Pushed away it shall be. Terrific idea, Bertie. Thank you, Jeeves. I like your nerve, bounding about the place saying, what ho, Gussie? It was a dastardly act to call out of that pies giving and shove it off on me. My dear old Gussie, just think of what it's going to do for you. There you'll be up on the platform, a romantic, impressive figure, the what you would call it of all eyes, and Madeline will see you in a totally new light. Oh, will she? Of course she will. Think not all the newt's friend, she knows. Think not all the dog's chiropodist she is acquainted with. But think not all the orator. Think not all the man of affairs. And it'll knock us sideways. Do you think so? Sure of it. I suppose it might be all right. But you seem so aloof, Bertie, so remote. It's 
especially when I see her sideways. Have you ever seen her sideways, Bertie? That cold, pure profile just takes all the heart out of one. Yes, well, you see, she needs to be softened up, sweetened. I've been thinking about this, Gussie, and you'll be pleased to hear that I have a plan. Be so good, Jeeves, as to shove that bally black thing back in the wardrobe and bring me my white mess jacket with the brass buttons. Oh, good heavens, sir. It was most remiss of me, but I fear I inadvertently omitted to pack the garment. I know you did, Jeeves, but I didn't. You'll find it in the other wardrobe. Very good, sir. The rift between Tuppy and my cousin Angela appears to be serious, Jeeves. <clears throat> Indeed, sir. Well, I've had rather a stunning idea, Jeeves. And I've been in conference with Mr. Glossop and everything is taped out. Indeed, sir. Jeeves, I'm sure that nothing is further from your mind, but you know you have a way of saying indeed, sir, which gives the impression that it's only a feudal sense of what is fitting which prevents you from substituting the word says you. I'm distressed to hear this, sir. Well, so you should be, Jeeves. Correct it. Very good, sir. You'll be glad to hear that I have taken steps in the matter of Tuppy and Angela. Indeed, sir. Jeeves? Sorry, sir. <clears throat> Please continue. Right. This is the plan. I have recommended to Tuppy that at dinner tonight he lay off the food. Sir? Oh, tut, Jeeves. Have you forgotten the telegram that I sent to Gussie Finknottle, steering him away from the sausages and ham? Well, this is more of the same thing. Pushing away the scoff is a universally recognised sign of love. Nothing elaborate, you see? No, sir. No, nothing strained or bizarre or far-fetched, just nature's remedy. It cannot fail to bring home the gravy, Jeeves. Surely you must see that. Well, sir... You don't think my scheme will work? I fear that Miss Angela may merely attribute Mr. Glossop's abstinence to indigestion, sir. I say, Jeeves, I've just had another thought. Oh, I am relieved, sir. Help me on with the jacket, Jeeves. Um, which way up does it go, sir? Startled me about that blasted money for your magazine again, are you? What are you doing with that gun? What? Oh, oh uh, heard someone creeping around outside last night. Tonight I'm going to be ready for them. I forbid you to play around with that gun. Blast it, Dahlia. I... Not another word, Tom. I forbid it. You know you always shoot the wrong people. think you're made up as? What? The, the jacket, you mean? You look like one of the chorus in Act Two of a touring musical comedy. Tut! What did you say? I said tut! Say it again and I'll biff you where you stand. I have enough to endure without being tutted at. Well, quite. Any tutting that's required, I'll attend to myself. My dear old aunt, your troubles are over. The Worcester brain has shifted smoothly into top gear once more. Oh, no. What have I done to deserve this? There is only one course for you to pursue. You must go on the Worcester diet. The Worcester diet? What is all this drivel? No, no, this is the real Tabasco. No, all you have to do is to refuse your oats at dinner tonight. Just sit there looking blistered and wave away each course with a weary gesture of resignation. Why? Why should I? <sighs> because... Because I'm prepared to bet, age a that at the conclusion of dinner, Uncle Tom will come up to you and he will say, Dahlia, darling. I take it he calls you Dahlia? Yeah. Dahlia, darling, I noticed at dinner tonight you were a bit off your feed. Is there anything wrong, Dahlia, darling? These Travises sound a pretty soppy couple of blighters to me. Is there anything I can do, Dahlia, darling? To which you will reply, yes, there jolly well is. 
Viz, reach for the checkbook and start writing. Bertie, that's positively bright. When did Jeeves think it up? I'll have you know, Aunt Dahlia, that this scheme is guaranteed 100% Worcester brain material. It's bound to work. You know, I think it might. I'll do it. I'm dreading sitting across the dinner table from Glossop, Madeline. Oh, poor Angela. Are you still upset about you and Tuppy? Love is such a heartbreak, isn't it? Heartbreak? I'm just boiling mad. The man is a blithering oaf. Magnifique. Tonight will be the top of Anatole's career. <laughs> Can't give a penny nowadays. Tax on this, tax on that, income tax. No one shall be paupers. I said to Dahlia only the other day, they begrudge you the very food you put in your mouth. Then there was that clown Harold. Messing about down at Hastings when he should have been at Westminster trying to think of a way to cut taxes. You and I hate these little jobs. Oh, yeah. We shouldn't have had those damn taxes walking in as though they owned the place for a start. They'd have us begging in the streets. I swear to God, they'd have us begging in the streets. I remember, I was in Jaramba. Whole families there in the streets. Not like my consommé or pomme d'amour? No, it is not possible. Oh, no, no, no. They will have my tambal de Rivivo Toulousien. Oh, oh. Voila! Hmm. Then look at that Benjamin Disraeli. Him and his damn book writing. The ruination of the Conservative Party. But they're all red now. Oh. I saw it coming. No, we will more. No, I mean. That unpleasant is at running me. That was only the beginning. Been downhill from that moment on, in my humble opinion. Ah, good now. Well, five minutes, not more. And on comes that Oliver Cromwell. How oh, terrible man with a face of gold here. Walks, carver. Put it in so ugly. Even when they buried him, they hadn't got it. They, they dug him up again. Put his head on a pike outside Westminster. Ah, oh, what well, do you know what that is? I blame the Romans. If Magnus Maxwell had hung on you, instead of pulling out his troops, the moment things got a bit tricky, the picture today would be a very different one. Where did I turn wrong? What bad articles did I do when I was small? Oh, to the garden and talk to her of hearts that yearn, intimating that there is one such actually on the premises. Then after about a quarter of an hour or so, you'll turn up and take over. Because by that time, her emotions will be so churned up that it'll be like leaping on a moving bus. The last time I leapt on the moving bus, Bertie, I hurt myself rather badly. Yes, it was more sort of a, in front of a bus, there, wasn't it, Gussie? Yes, but Bertie, what shall I say? Oh, there are hundreds of things you can say. You can say, 
How you've often thought that the stars are God's daisy chain. God's daisy chain? Hmm. Do you mind if I take some notes? Oh, note away. God's daisy chain. And then you can go on to say that twilight always makes you feel sad. Why? Well, uh, yes, well, that's precisely what you'll ask you. And then you'll have her. Your reply will be that it's because yours is such a lonely life. In fact, it might be a good idea to give her a description of a typical evening at home in Lincolnshire, intimating how you pace the meadows with a heavy tread. I generally sit indoors and listen to the wireless. No, you don't, Gussie. You pace the meadows with a heavy tread, wishing there was someone there to love you. And after that, it's easy. You just grab her by the hands, tell her you've got something to say to her, and then say it. Better have a couple of quick ones first. What, drinks, do you mean? But I don't drink. You don't drink? No. No, I didn't know that. Hmm, pity. It's generally acknowledged that a moderate skinful on these occasions is uh, of the essence. Well, I suppose I could have some orange juice. Well, yes, if you think it would help. Hmm. It might be a good idea to heave a bit of a sigh at this point. Heave. Sigh. Then grab her by the hand and give her the works. Grab hand. Give. Works. And that's all there is to it. Thank you, Bertie. <coughs> well, would you, um... Uh... Would you like some milk or coffee? Andrew? No, thank you, Mr. Blossom. Hello, Angela. Hello, Tuppy. Yes. Ah, Jeeves. Haven't seen Miss Bassett around anywhere, have you? Oh, she is, I believe, sir, in the sewing room. Sewing room? If you'll allow me, sir. Oh. I trust your dinner plan was a success, sir? Howling, Jeeves, as you'll no doubt be surprised to hear. Tuppy and Miss Travers are reunited in the drawing room. This is indeed good news, sir. <coughs> Ill-informed servants hall gossip had it that the cook, Anatole, had given his notice, sir. Yes, well, of course, I'm not in a position to comment on chit-chat, Jeeves, but I suppose there is always a possibility. Anatole is foreign, Jeeves. Really, sir? And therefore, excitable. I shall bear it in mind, sir. <laughs> the sewing room, sir. Thank you, Jeeves. <clears throat> oh, man, little old thing. Careful, Stroll. Jolly good. That uh, dinner tonight, I couldn't eat any of it, of course. Far, far too upset. Look, I, I don't suppose you noticed, but I actually pushed away a whole plate of roast lamb. For God's sake! Oh, Bertie, what a beautiful night. Rather. All the little flowers have closed their eyes. Really? And all the little stars have woken up. <laughs> oh, look! The little bunnies! How still they are! Yes, yes, they are marvellously still, aren't they? Yes. You know, Madeline, it's a funny old world. As a matter of fact, where are you going? Well, I thought we were going for a walk. Oh, I, uh, I thought we had. <laughs> oh, dirty. <laughs> Uh, well, I thought there was a snake or... Oh, no, maybe not. I think old Mr. Moon is ever so shy, Bertie. He keeps hiding behind the clouds. <laughs> yes, yes, he does, doesn't he? Yes, now, Madeline, um, talking of being shy, you know, there's an aching heart here at Brinkley Court. Ah, oh, yes. Life is very sad, isn't it? Yes, well, it is for some people, yes. Now, I mean, take this aching heart, for instance. Um, this heart that I'm talking about is aching like bilio. You mean for love? The problem is, it can't quite bring itself up to scratch to tell you the position. Just as it's about to give you the SP, it catches sight of you sideways and words fail it. It's silly, of course, but uh, there it is. <gasps> Don't say any more, Bertie. No, right. 
Well, I wasn't going to, actually. Uh, that's about it, I think. I suspected this at Cannes, when you used to stand and stare at me without saying a word, but with whole volumes in your eyes. No! Yes! A girl always knows. And then you followed me down here, and there was that same dumb, yearning look in your eyes. And now you stammer out these halting words. No, it doesn't come as a surprise. But I'm sorry, Bertie, but I'm afraid it's impossible. Oh, really? Oh, well, can't be helped. Uh, oh, dear. Life is such a muddle, isn't it? Uh, yes. Well, I'm, yes, I always say that. Life is such a muddle, I say. Wait a minute. Do you mean there's someone else? That he doesn't care for me. Well, at least he hasn't said anything. You see, I was staying with some friends in the country, and I'd gone for a walk with my dog, and the poor wee mite got a nasty thorn in its little foot, and I didn't know what to do. And suddenly, this handsome man came along. Wow! I beg your pardon? Uh, nothing. Nothing. No, I, I, I've just remembered there's a letter I must write tonight without fail. Good heavens, there's Gussie Finknottle. Where? Uh, over there. Ah, oh, yes, there he is. Um, yes, well, I think I'd better be going in. Gussie will take care of you. Ah, oh, Tuppy, I wanted to see you. Oh, yes. Well, I'm here, aren't I? Has Angela come clustering round yet? No, she has not. Oh, that's very odd. She must have noticed your lack of appetite. Lack of appetite? I'm as hollow as the Grand Canyon. Oh, be brave, Tuppy. Fix your thoughts on that cold steak and kidney pie in the larder. You would go and bring that up, wouldn't you, just as I've managed to stop thinking about it? Well, look, why don't you just buzz off, Worcester? Delia. How dare you show your face in here? Oh, Aunt Delia, if I may say something, you seem somewhat pipped. Pipped? Oh, but stand fast, Aunt Delia, because pretty soon Uncle Tom will be along here full of sympathy and anxious inquiry. Do you know where my husband is? Uh, well, he was here at dinner. I know he was here at dinner, you nincompoop. He is now in his study. His face buried in his hands, groaning about civilization. Any chance that I had of getting the money off him is now gone. Eh? Why? Because Anatole has given notice. What? Anatole has given notice as a result of one of your driveling schemes. Oh, good heavens. It's no good saying good heavens. Well, the, uh, yes, now you're upset, uh, and that's understandable. Certainly, certainly this is a nasty jar for one and all. The only nasty jar there is, is the one I'm going to put your remains in. Now, now, Aunt Delia, don't do anything hasty, because uh, I can fix everything. Don't you dare try one of your lunatic schemes. Mr. Finknottle is feeling unwell, sir. Everybody's been very kind. No complaints to make. No complaints at all. I wish the world was a newt. But how could anything go wrong? All he had to do was propose. So one would be disposed to imagine, sir. However, upon finding himself alone with the young lady, he confesses to having lost his nerve. In such circumstances, gentlemen frequently talk at random, sir, saying the first thing that chances to enter their head. This, in Mr. Finknottle's case, would seem to have been the newt, its treatment in sickness and in health. Bad, Jeeves. Yes, sir. And how long did he go on talking about newts? 
According to Mr. Finknottle, he supplied Miss Bassett with very full and complete information, sir. Very bad, Jeeves. Indeed, sir. He was just observing that newts differ from salamanders in the shape of the tail and that a marked sexual dimorphism prevails in most species when the young lady rose and said she thought she would go back to the house. And then? She went, sir. Oh, difficult, Jeeves. Yes, sir. Yes, I shall have to try and burnish the brain a bit, see if I can't find a way out of this. I'm sure Mr. Finknottle will be most grateful, sir. <sighs> will that be all, sir? Yes, thank you, Jeeves, yes. One moment, my fine chap, Mrs. Travers. I can take a few smooths with a rough, is true. But you do not play larks against me on my food. No, I do not remain no longer in this house. No, no, I dissolve and do not stay planted. I am a blighter of principle.
Mr. Glossop, what are you doing? I should have told you, Mama. Mr. Glossop always likes to have three or four good meals during the night. It helps keep him going till breakfast. <laughs> I'm not crazy, Mrs. Travers. You be nice, nice to Anatole, Anatole. Now, you just drop those knives, Anatole. And what are you doing with that gun, Tom Travers? Nothing, my dear. This is the end. Anatole, he is terminus agent! This is all your fault, Worcester. Me? Um, what have I done? Jeeves. Pack Mr. Worcester's bags. <laughs>